special public meeting at, uh, to order. We're going to go through the same process we do with a, a regular council meeting, so let's please stand for a moment of silence. Please salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mr. Devine. Here. Mr. Sabatini. Mr. Pazza. Ms. Collins. Here. Mr. Rodriguez. Mr. Trinnell. Here. Mr. Plants. Here. Mr. Here. Can I just say that Ms. Rodriguez isn't here because she's doing a presentation for the Latino Alliance. So. And Mr. Pez is on his honeymoon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the first thing we need to do is call up Gordon Walker our financial advisor and this is regarding the bond that we talked about refinancing about two months ago or more good evening every can everybody hear me okay sure. okay is there anybody in the front here that does not have a copy of this report with PFM's circle on it Okay. Um, <clears throat> tonight for the council's consideration is an ordinance which will, if you enact it, will refinance, we refund or refinance the uh, borough's 2004 general obligation bonds um, into a lower interest rate, which is happening all over the country, uh, particularly where you have an issue that's callable without penalty. And back in uh, June, on June 4th, when I was here, we projected a savings after expenses of 881000 And if you look on um, uh, the back page here, on page 4, you'll see that based on the rate of interest that we got last week, now bear in mind, you'll enact the ordinance if you do on the variable rate, and then tomorrow morning we will convert to whatever the fixed rate is, and we're using the rate we got last. For, for this purpose, you'll see... In column four, we're using a, a rate of 1.90. Back in June, uh, the rate used was 212. So because interest rates are lower, the savings is higher. And uh, if, it, if it is at about, it, it shouldn't change too much up or down tomorrow by tomorrow morning. But if it hangs in at the 1.90 or 1.91 level, we're looking at slightly over a million dollars savings uh, to the borough, which is a tremendous savings particularly in that we're talking only 7.4, we're borrowing 7,391,000. One thing leading up to this, in the last couple of months, we had to get a credit rating for the borough, and uh, uh, happy to report that the, your rating came in. At, we needed a minimum rating of A- minus or better. We came in at, you came in at A+, plus, which is two grades higher Two grades higher than the minimum, and they look at everything, your finances, the management, uh, the type of people live here, the industries, the unemployed, everything. They look at everything. And uh, so that's a, that's, you should be proud of your A-plus rating. Believe me, I have a lot of clients that do not have ratings that high. The next step up is double A, so uh, that, I'm reporting on that. So um, uh, do you have any, does the council have any questions about, uh, we're well, not extending the term, let me just finish up here, we're not extending the term of the issue, which runs to 2025, and the payments uh, starting next year are going to be the same as you have now, so the savings that I mentioned, and most of it is accruing uh, this year. So I'll take any questions. What, what I like the public to know and council to know is that when we started this, it was about $800,000 right. in June. Right. We're now over a million. Over a million. Dollars, keeping our fingers crossed tomorrow, we should be around a million, a little over a million. Right. I don't think interest rates are going to change that much in the morning. We're hoping. That well, things. it's going to depend a little bit what happened today, what happened Friday, you know. Right. So I it's a combination of tomorrow morning and a few days back from that, but uh, 
We so, can't control the market. So basically what we're doing, we're not extending the loan. We're refinancing the loan. The interest we're saving on the loan over the next 13 years or whatever it is, is where we're getting our savings. We could take the savings over time. Uh, no, what I'm saying is that's how we're calculating the savings. But you're realizing the savings this year, front. but uh, right. the, the interest rate over time is way lower than what you're paying now. And council, this council agreed, and I don't know if it needs to be done by how, if it needs to be done by motion, but we agreed to spend this money on capital improvement projects. Right. I think 600 and some thousand dollars is set aside for capital improvement projects, and the Six, other three or four hundred thousand could right. be spent. Right, 600 for for these purposes tonight, you'll see a six 623,000 must be spent on projects. The rest of the savings can be spent either on projects or whatever. Or on our discretion. Yeah, yeah, because it's freed up revenues. Okay. Uh, the A the A plus rating didn't just happen. It came from a lot of hard work over the last seven or eight years that this council put into straighten out the finances in the borough. And Jim, I don't know if you want to speak on where we were seven years ago or eight years ago to where we are today. I think uh, the rating uh, agency's representatives came down on uh, July 6th and Mr. Salerno sat in, uh, Mr. Walker, our our uh, independent auditor was there. Uh, I called Angie. Angie was on vacation. She came in. She was able to come in, and uh, we answered all their questions. Uh, they subsequently uh, emailed some additional questions, which we answered. But I think one of the big uh, things that they uh, uh, hung their hat on for the uh, significant rating that we got, uh, which uh, was two grades above what we needed, uh, was uh, the debt service, the way you've been managing the uh, debt service. And uh, uh, I think I pointed that out in a recent memo to council dated July 13th. Uh, you know, it's the non-electoral borrowing capacity of the borough. It's like your own credit card. I, you heard me mention it before. That back uh, as of December 31st, 2004, a uh, borrowing capacity of three million dollars uh, as of the end of December of 2011 the non electoral borrowing capacity of the borough was 15 million so it's like a five time fivefold uh, increase in your ability to borrow so you know, I'm, nobody's recommending we go out and you know borrow the money and whatever you know now that we got it down to a very manageable uh, level because Back in uh, 05, like 51% of your tax revenue was going just to pay for the debt service. Now we're down to 18%, which is basically the ice rink. So the idea now, you got it down to a manageable level, let's, let's keep it there and make sure nobody can get our credit card and start spending uh, willy-nilly there. So uh, again, I, I was... Uh, Sweating the uh, A minus rating uh, because of uh, you know various things, but I think overall they were impressed and they I think they gave us an outstanding uh, rating. So uh, and I think that's reflected in the over a million dollars that we hope to be able to settle on come September 6. So. Well, I, I know from dealing with Jim every day and over the last seven or eight years mm -hmm. that the financial part of this borough truly falls on his shoulders and he does an outstanding job in managing this borough and the financial part of this borough because you know he brings us in and he informs us of what's going on but without his ability to do what's being done here this wouldn't just just this just doesn't happen I can tell you that right now so I'd like to thank you for all your hard work and dedication to this town and you don't get paid overtime for it either <laughs> So Does what, anybody else have any questions for Gordon? Just real quick, Gordon. When, when that rate gets locked in tomorrow morning, how is that done? By a phone uh, call? Okay, what happens is, that, uh, uh, assuming that you enact the ordinance tonight and you vote yes on it, um, I will um, 
contact Lucian Calhoun, who runs the DelVal program, and tell him you have uh, enacted the ordinance which authorizes the borrowing, and I, I'm going to tell him that you have authorized me to fix the rate. He will call New York and do this, that, and the next thing, and email me in an hour or two as to what the rate is. It's, it's not something that's made up. It's a, it's a function of, of the market. And so I will then forward that to Mr. Dillon, and it'll be, uh, you know, whatever rate is in that email is the rate. Okay. And that'll be the rate from now till 2025 unless you prepay it or, re or refinance again. And you get up early in the morning, correct? Well, it's not going to happen I real early. Okay. <laughs> I understand. All right, Gordon. And then also, okay. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And, and we are going to, uh, after the, you're done with this, we're going to consider locking in a rate on one of the other loans. So there will be two rates that we actually get tomorrow. Okay. But, uh, so the council should, should consider the vote on the ordinance. on one and two now, or do you want to want, want a motion to approve the Okay, so on number one, could I get a motion? Mr. President, I'd like to make a um, motion for ordinance refinancing of 2004 bonds. Oh, that are, that's what you wanted, right? Okay, got it. Gordon Walker's attachments. Okay, under Gordon Walker's attachments. I, I intend to. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a second? A second by Mr. Polensky. Any questions or comments? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Devine? Yes. Ms. Collin? Yes. Ms. Trinnell? Yes. Mr. Polensky? Yes. Mr. DiGiuseppe? Yes. Item two on the agenda. Uh, this is a proposed uh, resolution uh, uh, fixing the rates on our remaining outstanding variable bonds. Uh, the bonds deal with the borrowing that we have for the Chestnut and Elm Street and the Public Works Facility project. Uh, right now, uh, they are at a variable rate, and you just don't know what's going to happen with the variable rates, uh, we feel. If uh, it's recommended that we go to a fixed rate, right now we're looking at in the area of 2.2%. Uh, so uh, our auditor for one, and uh, I think our uh, rating agency was uh, uh, leaning towards uh, recommending that we go to that fixed rate because uh, something happens in the marketplace and the interest rates start going through the roof, then we'll wish to God we had, you know, settled at a fixed rate. And I, you know, I don't think we want to get too greedy. I think now's the time to go with a fixed rate. Honoring this for the last couple of years, and I, I think now's the time. I highly recommend that council fixes the rate in the morning. But we anticipate in the area 2.2%. Mr. President, I'd like, I'd like to make a resolution fixing the rate on the current vari variable rate bonds, and that's also attached here. Right, second. Second by Mr. Polensky. Questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. The, uh, the rate on the current variable rate bonds that we're doing now on those loans, are they just an interest-only loan, or are we paying principal on those variable rates? Principal and interest. Okay. That's it. Other questions or comments? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Devine? Yes. Ms. Cullen? Yes. Ms. Chanel? Yes. Yes. Mr. DiGiuseppe? Yes. Okay, before we get to number three, I'm going to have uh, Kurt Schroeder speak on the feasibility study for the peers down at the uh, Waterfront. Everybody had in their packet a packet of what's we're proposing. This is so cool.
or is it just a blown up version when we have an attack around? Uh, good evening. Uh, to give you an update on, on uh, where we are right now, literally today we just finished doing this color rendering of a uh, type of dock facility that can be installed at the waterfront. It's an extension off the existing waterfront pier uh, by the gazebo. And uh, over the past few months, our office has been working on uh, preparing several grant applications that we spoke about. Uh, at the last uh, meeting, uh, one from federal government, one from the state, and one from the county. Uh, we, we've submitted the state grant. That's been in for a few weeks. On the 1st of August, we submitted the, uh, the county grant. Thank you. And that's actually the grant that you're uh, considering a resolution for tonight. We had to submit it but we can follow up with the resolution uh, after this meeting and then they'll invite us in on around the 20th or 24th of this month to give a presentation to their committee for the uh, Delaware River waterfront and uh, we're pursuing a million dollars under that county grant program and then at the end of September we will be submitting a final version of the grant to the federal government and we have a preliminary draft into them now, and they're going to do a cursory review for us and make sure we have everything in there that they need in order to consider this application. Uh, also, since I was last here uh, and the borough retained ST Hudson Engineering, Rich Long is here from that organization, and he's going to present the feasibility study that they completed. And that's included in your packets uh, tonight. And that's how this concept plan was generated. So I'll turn this over now to uh, Rich Long, who can answer any questions. He'll give a little background on what they did. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Rich Long, and I'm the vice president. Can you hear me all right? of uh, ST Hudson Engineers. Uh, just to give you a little background before I discuss uh, what the uh, we did for the borough in this feasibility study, um, give you a little background on Hudson Engineers. We are a maritime uh, consulting engineering firm. We've been in business since 1967. Our uh, focus is in uh, marine consulting engineering work. Uh, our main clients are most of the major oil companies as well as uh, the port authorities. And uh, what we do on a pretty much a day-to-day -day basis, our core business is in designing and doing uh, uh, rehabilitation work for marine structures uh, for industrial and commercial clients. Uh, to give you a little background on uh, what we put together for this uh, feasibility study, uh, this, this uh, study that we ha put together for you tonight uh, is really about what they would call in your applications a, a day dock and an access pier. And uh, so what we've done here, we've put together a, a concept that uh, allows you to go after funding for uh, day dock boats, which means these are not transient uh, docks. Transient would mean that there is an opportunity that the uh, boater would stay overnight. In fact, a day dock is just what it actually means, that you would come here and access these uh, floating docks uh, during the day, but there would be no overnight opportunity for these boats to stay there overnight. And let me explain a little bit what you actually see on this uh, concept uh, that's before you tonight. If you came down uh, Mill Street and you came down to where your gazebo area is and then that little part of the fixed pier uh, beyond that, uh, what we've 
showing here is that we have an, an approach way that actually goes out into the uh, Delaware River and then you'll see, and that's what you're showing in the, I believe that's the tannish color. Uh, and then a, another piece of this pier that would come down parallel to the Delaware River. And, and that's really the access component of this uh, project. And that is what we would call a high deck pier. Uh, that is concrete is supported by typically steel piles and I'll explain a little reason why steel piles and then that gives uh, the opportunity now to put in two what we would uh, term as concrete floating docks uh, typically um, if you were in a more marina situation you would see uh, floating docks that are about eight feet in width and uh, a lot of times you'll see them with a timber deck and uh, floats underneath. Uh, the reason that's sort of a tannish color is that these will actually be concrete floating docks. Um, in the Delaware River, uh, as you can imagine, if you've ever been on your waterfront park and uh, watched some of the tugs and ships go by, uh, you have the opportunity uh, for waves from those passing uh, vessels. Uh, these concrete floating docks are uh, heavy and, and very stable. You'll also note that the width, instead of being about eight feet in width, are, uh, we're proposing something more in the range of about 18 feet. So it provides a very stable wide platform. Uh, also, in this particular section of the river, uh, when we have uh, storm events, uh, you can have uh, water coming down this river uh, that um, is clearly higher than the normal high tide. Uh, we've put this pier elevation that would give you access to the docks at about 11 feet. Uh, our research would indicate that the worst storm event that you've had in this area is a little bit uh, about a half a foot above that. So at least in this very preliminary feasibility study, we're saying we're slightly uh, below that. The piles for your floating docks would actually go much higher than that. Uh, the reason I mentioned that this excess pier uh, is supported on steel piles uh, are for several reasons. Uh, this, the Delaware River is a freshwater river uh, in times of winter, not like we had last year, which was a lot milder, but you, you tend to have uh, periods where ice would form uh, on the Delaware River. Uh, the nice thing about uh, steel piles is that they would be designed in a way to resist <coughs> the, uh, the ice flows that you would uh, potentially encounter on this river. Also, uh, if there was heavy debris in this river, uh, the steel piles <coughs> also resist that. The, uh, uh, piles that would support the uh, concrete floating docks would also be uh, steel piles for that same reason. Uh, so as I said, that's, uh, and what we've done is at least, we don't have any hydrographic information right now, but based on some of the research that we've seen as far as depths of water, uh, we would like to have this project where there's no dredging. Uh, going after a dredging permit is fairly complex and allows for a fair amount of time. Right. And so ultimately, if this project got to the next step, one of the first things we would do is perform a hydrographic survey so we actually know the uh, exact depths of water. We've placed this uh, concept uh, as it is right now in an area where we believe there is adequate water for the uh, inside uh, berth area. Uh, so uh, that's about what we put together for you tonight. Just so everybody knows, when we had a couple meetings uh, with Rich and Kurt and the council vice president attended the meeting. The docks changed a little bit because we wanted to get two rows of boats in. So we had to go out a little bit further with the front pier and then there was what two, four, six, eight. Yeah, the the uh, concept that you see boats. right now allows for uh, 25 day boats 
the application requires you to have a minimum of boat length of 26 feet. And as you can see by the layout, there's uh, more than adequate room for vessels even larger than 26 yeah, feet. Large so if we wanted to bring one in, we'll pull in the front of that. Hall. Yeah, the, the, one of the reasons that we selected the, uh, the wider concrete uh, floating dock, even though, uh, as I said, stability is an important uh, factor here, uh, in the uh, floating dock that is out on the uh, river face, it also gives you the opportunity uh, for a much larger vessel or, as we would say, sometimes an exhibit vessel might come into the area. We also, uh, in the uh, drawing that we prepared for your grant application, there is a uh, vessel over on the Burlington side uh, that uh, could potentially trans, uh, trans <laughs> come across <laughs> to the other side. And, uh, and this floating dock uh, would be adequate enough to handle that. So as I said, uh, when you look at all that we've put together uh, on the surface, one might say, well, holy cow, an eight foot floating dock is what you normally see in normal marina situations. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, this is a structure that has viability and longevity to it, and that's why we've uh, selected that. Uh, just so you know, uh, a project that we're uh, doing some work on right now, um, these clo uh, concrete floating docks actually, uh, in s some similar designs, actually can function as a breakwater. So they actually can resist the waves. So that's one of the reasons we've also selected that. The mass of this structure really allows it to resist uh, waves and uh, some of the forces that you potentially could see on this river. Does anybody have any questions for Rich, Lorraine? Rich, uh, how long would this structure last, this type of structure? It's a great question. Longer than I will be here, I would okay. say. That. No, I'm just, typically, just so you have some idea, uh, a, the access pier, to give you some idea, when we do a design life for a structure like that, it, we would at least tell you it's 40 plus years. Okay. Uh, it, what will happen is, if you fast forward 30 years from now, Ultimately, uh, the coating on the steel piles uh, starts to wear away, and you have the opportunity for the steel to start to degradate. And, and so what happens is somewhere in that 25 to 30 year range, then there's usually some recoding that's done, uh, some uh, additional work there. But, uh, but these structures will obviously uh, test the te uh, you know, time for sure. What, what kind of maintenance besides the recoding would you see in the future? Uh, that, that's really going to be about it. Uh, the, the pier structure itself is all going to be uh, concrete. Uh, so concrete, as you know, would last uh, a significant number of years. And that's the other reason why we uh, would select ultimately uh, the concrete component uh, for the floating docks. Now, uh, that is a great question. For instance, uh, there is always the opportunity that some of the, uh, the floats themselves could experience uh, some damage. The beautiful part about these kind of floating docks is that they're in segments. So they could be taken out a new component put underneath and put it right back in service. Is there an inspection process that goes on? Like, uh, like Well, that's a great question. As time goes on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, typically, if you would imagine, after the first eight or nine years, because this is such a brand new structure, uh, you wouldn't look at this for probably at least the first seven or eight years. Okay. What normally happens, uh, once a, a structure gets in that you know, 10 to 15 year range, uh, then we have, we have commercial hard hat divers on staff. And typically what you would do is you would go out with your divers and inspect that section of, frankly, you'll be looking at the pier and the piles from the low water line up and everything is going to look absolutely wonderful. What's always important is, especially as structures get 20, 30, 40 years old, is start to look underneath. And that's what would happen. Uh, Typically for our clients, depending on the age of the structure, uh, the older ones every three years, something like this in the beginning, 
uh, definitely no uh, sooner than every five. Okay. I mean, I see the Delaware River as our greatest asset. So, I mean, this is I, I think one of the things that uh, I, I, I took a ride after we had had one of our meetings and uh, drove up along your your waterfront there a little bit and of course the the view over to New Jersey is just absolutely spectacular so I'm sure in the fall with the change of leaves and whatnot and you have a, a beautiful park setting one of the things that I didn't mention also about uh, the beauty of the access pier is obviously it gives you an opportunity to get out to the floating docks but one of the other really important things that this application that you're going to be submitting on does is it oh, they they talk about public access and public access is a very important component when you're going for your federal and state permits as well as grant applications and what this will do is right now um, you have where um, your uh, Pier ends right now. Um, I, in fact, when I drove by there tonight, you had some people right on the edge of that uh, pier. Uh, as you can see, you're now going to be extended out into the Delaware River. It gives the public now an opportunity to experience the river where they've never experienced it before. So the, the nice thing about this access pier, it really gives you an opportunity to have different opportunities on the Delaware River that you didn't have before. The other thing we did on the very end of the, the, the approachway coming out there, you'll see that that approachway juts out a little further than where the, it actually covers the end of where the access pier is. And the reason we did that is if you really got into a, a bad ice situation, um, that also is out front there also that provides some uh, buffer there. But the end of that would also give you an opportunity. The floating dock isn't there. It would give uh, your residents an opportunity to get out there uh, where now they're, you know, 100 and some feet in further inshore, which w would really be a nice opportunity for your public. Okay. We talked about people fishing off the pier and different things. So, And just for the record, part of, I don't know if you read the letter I sent for all these grant applications, part of the application which one of them I think is 25 years Kurt we got to guarantee it Correct. that it'll maintain 25 years so when we designed this pier when we had these meetings we designed this to last well beyond 25 years and very and very low maintenance that's why we're talking about cement because we don't want to build something and then put this burden on the taxpayers down the road. Well, I, I wanted everyone to hear that. You know, I, I think one of the other one. things when you asked about the piles that I, I apologize, I didn't tell you about. The other thing that we do in a design like this is uh, the piles are actually filled with concrete and we put a reinforcing cage in there. So there's, there's really some redundancy that we put in there that really provides that. Uh, it's like building a bridge. We are. Yeah. That's yeah. But when we when we took this into consideration, we know it's a great asset for the town, which are other things that we want to do, but we also never want to put a burden on taxpayers down the road. Well, we need two hundred thousand dollars to maintain this pier or we need a hundred thousand to maintain we made it low maintenance and longevity was the two things that we talked about. So and I think you accomplished all that. Thank you. Lorraine, anything else? That's it from me. Tony? Thank you. Nah, good. Looks good. Leo? Uh, looks, it's about time we, um, Mill Street especially. Robin? Well, I have a good question, but Lorraine took them off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, we need to do number three on the agenda, and that's the application that everybody has to apply. It's, if I need a motion on that. Mr. President, I'd like to may adopt a resolution authorizing the filing application to Bucks County Open Space Program requesting funding for borough waterfront improvements, borough engineer Hudson feasibility study 73012 attached. Second, second by Ms. Collin. Any questions or comments? Yes. Ms. Collin? Yes. Mr. Nell? Yeah, oh yes, I'm sorry. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. 
Okay, uh, I'm going to open up public comment on anybody who would like to speak before we close this segment of the meeting and open up our regular work session. So anybody in the public would like to speak on anything at this time, please go to the podium. Well, the chief's going to the podium. Oh, no. Amy, could you just wait? Oh, sure. Anybody would like to speak on any of these agenda items? Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn this first part of the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second, meeting to adjourn. Okay, now we're going to open up our regular uh, agenda meeting for August 3rd. And I'll open that up with public participation. So, Amy, you're up. <laughs> Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Amy Kasar. I'm the managing director of Bristol Riverside Theater. Uh, and uh, in a myriad of ways, BRT gets support and recognition from this council. And for that, uh, I want to express my sincere thanks and the thanks of the board and staff and uh, the tens of thousands of patrons who attend BRT every year. Every year I come uh, once a year here to uh, speak quickly. And I repeat the same phrase that when you fund BRT, you fund Bristol Borough businesses. And this year it was really uh, more true than ever before. Last year at this time I came before you to talk about an ambitious new project at BRT as we began a shift in operating from a theater company to operating as a performing arts center with a theater at its core. I'm here this year to tell you that we did just that. BRT is now open an additional 15 weeks every season. Uh, the, we, the year is still four weeks for, from over for us, and we've already sold nearly 13,000 more tickets than we did in last year. What does that mean for Bristol Borough? It means that this year BRT, BRT drove an extra $481,000 into local businesses like restaurants, gas stations, and hair salons, bringing our total impact on local businesses this year to $1,547,000. There's more. Theater is a personnel-heavy enterprise. Behind every person that you see on that stage is a slew of carpenters, electricians, stagehands, follow-spot operators, light board programmers, costumers, and many, many more. This isn't something that, that's outsourced. It isn't something that's now being done by machines. Just like when Shakespeare did it, theater still takes people. It still takes just as many people. In fact, it actually takes more now that we have all those lights to program and the sets to construct. With the additional construction, event hosting, electrical work, and everything else this season, we added 32 full-time equivalent jobs in Bristol Borough. Not to mention all of the additional audience members added approximately 11 more full-time jobs uh, at the B Bristol businesses which benefit from our patrons. So for the mathematically challenged among us, uh, that's 43 new jobs in Bristol Borough this year because of the expansion at BRT. All told, the expansion was a huge success for all of us for the restaurants that sold 13,000 additional meals this year, to the theater that attracted its first New York Times and Wall Street Journal reviews, to the borough residents who had 50 additional nights of theater open to them. For all of us, this year was phenomenal. But it's not over. We don't call it a day. Next year is an equally impressive one, and it begins about three weeks after this season ends. Uh, this main stage season this year includes the gut-wrenching Oleana, which is a play about sexual harassment or harassment in education, the heartwarming What a Glorious Feeling about the real story behind the making of Singing in the Rain, the scream-inducing fun of Death Trap, which is probably the greatest thriller ever written for the stage, the hilarity of Gilbert and Sullivan's classic Pirates of Penzance, and we're going to finish the season with uh, a project that you're going to be hearing a lot about, Inherit the Wind, which will offer opportunities for the whole community to get involved in the making of theater, not just the watching of it. On top of that, this year we have our first family series with The Velveteen Rabbit, How I Became a Pirate, and Angelina Ballerina. Our first official concert series with Don McCluskey, acclaimed violinist Elizabeth Pitcairn, the up-and-coming Parker Quartet, and Sandy Hackett's Rat Pack Show. We've got comedy this year. Steve Solomon is back with My Mother's Italian, My Father's Jewish, and I'm Home for the Holidays. Alan Safier is back with Humbug, which is a one-man Christmas carol, and comedian Judy Gold will close out our season. We may be up and running with the expanded season, but we're not done raising money towards it. 
Every year, ticket sales account for just about half of uh, the revenue that we need to keep uh, bringing these kinds of work to the stage, and that means that we have over a million dollars to raise every year. Uh, for those of you watching at home, uh, there are all sorts of ways to be part of this. For a gift of just $50, you can name your own outlet in our shop. For $150, you can name a sink. You can name refrigerators, bathrooms, walls, ceilings. We need everybody's help to get this project done. And it's a project that pours money into Bristol Borough businesses. It's a project that makes our town a great place to live and to visit. Uh, it's a project that provides positive outlets for our youth. Uh, and you can do that all on our website, brtstage.org. That's brtstage.org. Um, this council, though, specifically uh, supports two programs, Art Rageous and the $5 Bristol Nights. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk quickly about those two programs. Artrageous culminated last week in four public performances. For those who don't know, Artrageous is a truly unique summer camp for kids ages 7 to 17 who think that they are spending their summer learning fun things like dance and voice and acting, but are actually spending the summer learning interpersonal communication, public speaking, collaboration skills, all while de developing self-confidence and self-efficacy. For years, we have had waiting lists of kids who want to attend, and I am delighted, thrilled, uh, to say that this year, in addition to funding from Bristol Borough, Bristol Friends, and the Schrank Foundation, we received a very generous grant from the United Way 21st Century Learning Center to expand the camp. So this year, Art Rages topped out at 120 participating kids. If you missed the final performance last week, you missed something really special, and I hope that you take a moment next summer to come check it out. It's truly unique. Um, for many years, with your support, we have also been able to offer tickets to Bristol residents for the first two performances of every main stage show for just $5. Last year, the popularity of that program continued to grow uh, as more residents than ever took advantage of it. And since I know that this meeting is broadcast, I think it's worth restating. Uh, that BRT is available to every single resident of Bristol Borough for just $5. So take your girlfriend, your spouse, your children, your grandchild, a good friend, have dinner at one of the multitude of great restaurants that Bristol Borough has to offer, uh, come to the theater and see a show for just $5. It has to be the easiest and cheapest date you could ever come up with. Um, all you have to do is come to the box office, bring some form of identification that proves you're a resident, a driver's license, a piece of mail, really anything, uh, hand over $5 and enjoy the show. And we're able to offer that program because of the generous support of this council, so thank you. I've had the pleasure of welcoming many of you uh, into the theater to witness what it is that we do in this community. Those of you who we've seen this year, uh, we look forward to seeing you again and thank you for coming. Those of you who we haven't seen, I truly hope that you will take the time to come out this year and see what it is that we do. Uh, I know you're all borough residents, so take advantage of the $5 tickets. It's cheap. Uh, I promise you, you'll have a good time. Get to know us. We're your theater. Uh, and, and what we do is pretty uh, expansive. So I, I urge you to take a moment, take an evening, take an afternoon, and come see a show. Again, on behalf of the staff, the board, the artists, the volunteers, the students, the interns, and the audiences at BRT, I thank you for your ongoing commitment to this organization. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. It was really a fantastic year, so thank you for your part in it. Does anybody have any questions for Amy? Keep up the good work. Thank you. We'll see you at the theater. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Chief. You want to get Matt to come out yeah, here? Yeah, if you can have an opportunity to turn that on for us. All right, while you're talking, he could come okay. out. Okay. Uh, over the two-month period from June 1st to August 1st. All right, do you have a microphone? Yes. I'm sorry. We've had a rash of uh, break-ins of uh, motor vehicles uh, throughout, the t throughout the borough. And... Uh, we're all the way between Swain Street and McKinley Street, and all, all areas throughout that, the town. Um, we had something similar last year. Not a, it wasn't as great of a uh, of number of vehicles, but we did have it last year. We, we addressed it uh, aggressively. We had uh, bike patrol out, uh, foot patrol, unmarked vehicles. And uh, we were able to catch two people actually inside a vehicle committing the crime. And we think they were responsible for a large number of those, those break-ins last year. This year, 
We've tried similar logistics strategies, um, even more so, and we still haven't yet to, to catch the people that are, that are committing these crimes. However, during our investigation, uh, we were able to capture a photograph of a subject utilizing a credit card that was stolen from one of these vehicles. Uh, we have yet to identify them. Uh, we're hoping uh, any people that are in the audience today and those at home, if they would take a look at this picture, and I have a, another one. <coughs> if somebody recognizes the subject, please give us a call. Help us identify this person. If you want to talk directly to our, our detective, our number is 215-788-7813, extension 13. If you feel uncomfortable talking with us uh, or talking directly to the detective and you'd like to leave an anonymous tip with as much information about this person, please, same phone number, extension 50. Um, I, I can't express uh, how important it is for people to lock their doors. 99% uh, of these break-ins, they're just walking down the street trying the handles on the vehicles, and they're getting unlocked vehicles. That is how they're getting in. The most effective way of preventing something like this, in most of your cases, is just lock your vehicles. They don't want to make noise. Yes, we had some vehicles where the windows were smashed, and uh, throughout these past few months, uh, I think we had one that might have been smashed. Um, so please, lock the doors. That, I, that's, that's the best way of trying to prevent this, this type of activity. Again, if someone at home knows who this person is, please uh, give us a call. Um, last month, uh, our officers uh, patrolled the Puerto Rican Day Festival, and, and as well as this past weekend, uh, the Festival of Lights Boat Parade. And the, uh, the crowds were excellent. Uh, they were very ruly. Um, it was a good time, a uh, good, excellent uh, uh, show they put on. And about a third of our uh, department right now, this week, is going to be going to their annual mandatory training that's required by all police officers uh, to remain certified in Pennsylvania. That's about all I have right now. Okay, Lorraine, you have anything for the chief? Just one of my concerns about the car thefts, and because um, I am still getting calls about it, and of course I tell them to call the police. And but um, up in the Harriman section, where Farragut Avenue, all in that area, people are really alarmed and worried. So um, you know, I'm glad that you're on it, but I hope you catch the person soon. Really. Kind of activity outside their homes in the evening hours, early morning hours, please give us a call. If, if it's a crime in progress, touch dial 911 and we'll come. Hey, Lorraine. Tony, you have anything? No, I don't have anything. Leo? Robin? Okay, Chief. Uh, if Matt wants to flip-flop and pictures a couple more times, I'll just... Uh, And why don't you give the two numbers again, the, talk, the hotline number that we established and the... Yeah, our, our tip line is 215-788-7813, extension 50. And to speak directly to our detective, 215-788-7813, extension 13. Okay, thank you. All right, Lorraine, our fire chief is on vacation, just for the record. Lorraine, what do you have? First of all, I'd like to talk about Mill Run. Um, it looks so much better now that it's under our care. And um, I want to thank Mr. Dillon and uh, Mr. Waldron and the borough crew on be behalf of Greg and I because uh, the people in the area are so pleased with, you know, the way you've cleaned it up. Uh, thank you. And um, also at our last meeting, I mentioned to the chief and to a police officer about a problem that we were having. And the next day it was taken care of. Um, they stayed on site all day and secured safety in the area, and I just can't say enough thank you to you and your your crew. They did a great job, uh, the police. 
So, and also, um, something about Friday night, I guess, you know, we all had our power out. Most of us did anyway. I think part of Third Avenue didn't. Were you one of them? Um, our power wasn't out, but we didn't have our phones, and we didn't have our cable. Yeah. Um, I called Mr. Dillon, and right away when I, you know, found out, and uh, he was out of town with his family. And I know he doesn't like to, you know, for us to say this kind of thing, but he, he very quickly, hang on a sec, got on the phone with Pico and then came back to Bristol. And when I rode to one of the scenes, one of the sites that the, you know, the power went out where it was hit, he was there. And then later on, he went to the next site and stayed until it was completely taken care of. And um, he, he's just a, a great borough manager, and I want to thank him for that kind of thing. Um, and also, uh, next month, Chris Gatelli, who we're going to honor for getting the Tony Award, will be able to uh, come in, in in the month of September. So we'll, we'll talk about that again. Um, Later and also, I just wanted to ask Maria. I'm not in the minutes last month for um, being present. Can you can you make make a change to that? I'm sorry. Thank you. I just realized it's sitting here. And that's it. I'm finished. Thank you. Yeah, uh, a couple things. The, the first thing I would like to comment on was last month there was an ordinance pay. I wasn't here at that meeting. Uh, about the time public participation. Now, I, I understand why we want to do it to keep the, the meetings moving and, and things like that. But I also do not want to infringe on people's rights to speak. I was thinking maybe if we could have something where, you know, we do the first part of it. I mean, this is something we could talk about. Do the first part of it where it's time, maybe like you know, the three minutes or whatever you guys talked about. And then give that person, whoever's speaking, the opportunity at the end of the meeting to, to have their say. If they're willing to stay around for the whole meeting then and then still speak. Because I think it's very important. And it's not easy to go up there and talk, you know, and to put yourself out there. And sometimes I think people just, you know, that's their only recourse when they feel, you know, very frustrated and... You know, it's just their only time to really kind of vent and, and show their frustration. So in, in the era of being uh, less infringent on, you know, our rights, you know, our, our right of free speech and, and able to voice ourselves, I would like to maybe, you know, go back and look at that and, and maybe, you know, have something like that put in here. So I don't know how you guys feel about that. Um, the second thing, next month, I mean, in September, you said Chris Catelli is going to be able to, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. is, is there a way that we could do something besides, I know we talked about it last time, just something more grandiose for a guy coming from Bristol who wins a Tony Award? I mean, I was just in New York City on Friday night, and in the cab, they're talking about, you know, Newsies and Tony Award winning, and the dude's from Bristol. I would love to see a, a sign coming into Bristol, home of Tony Award winner Chris Catelli. I don't know how tough that is to do or what the process is, but how do we go about doing something like that? I, know, I don't know. You don't know? Maybe me and you, Moran, could talk about that figure out. Okay, the sure. Next step is. Um, the third thing I wanted to talk about was uh, although I do support the purchase of Mill Run, and I am excited that we're able to get that building for so cheap and make the people of the East Ward and the rest of, you know, of the borough feel comfortable. I'm not overjoyed about the way it went down. I don't like that, as a council person, I'm not aware of anything that's going on until so it's already said and done. And there are other people, you know, I mean, our solicitor knows what's going on before we do. I'm not, I'm not okay with that. So I just want to put that on record. If there are things that are going on, I think council should be aware of them before well, other people. Well, I disagree with that entire statement. Why is that? Because the entire council mm -hmm. was aware of, we were negotiating the deal, 
every meeting before we walked out here, I tried to update council on where we were, how close we were to a settlement, and what was going on. Maybe you just weren't paying attention in the back room. No, but there is no was. way. There is no way that this deal was negotiated without one member sitting here could turn around right now and tell me they didn't know what was going on. You may not have known every detail, but you knew there was negotiations going on. We didn't reach a settlement number until a few days before. And there's only two people that can do most of this is the solicitor because there's legal questions that need to be answered. Okay. Well, so I'm going to turn around and I'm going to tell you I had absolutely no that you don't pay attention in the back room. Right. All the, uh, see, here's the thing about it. When I went and looked at uh, the itemized billing of our, of our solicitor, there, he was he was already in meetings way before you even brought that up to us. You didn't bring that up to us until, until the last, you know, the last second of the deal. If, I mean, that's the reality. I disagree with that. I know you disagree, but that's the reality. So it's not that I wasn't paying attention. It's was that's counsel, the reality. Was counsel, I mean, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I'm sure that uh, everybody knew what was going on. At the last minute, right? At no. the last hour, everybody was aware. All I'm saying is, I'm not against it. All I'm saying is, I wish I was a part of it from the beginning. Why you were going to negotiate the deal? Uh, I'd like to be a part of it, be aware of it, but I don't have a problem negotiating the deal. I think it would be okay. That's fine. Right. Bring a deal to the table that you can negotiate. Well, I think that's the part. The part is, it's, a, it's supposed to be a team effort. Right. And this that's, council, that's the thing. It's to this be entire team. council knew what was going on. No, they didn't. Ralph. Okay. Well, that's your opinion. It's not opinion. It's the, it's the truth. It's reality. They didn't know. We know what was going on. I knew that we had been talking to Mill Run for quite some time, and I knew that Greg and and Lorraine had been invited to sit in on meetings about it. I mean, yeah, I, did you know what's going on with Mill Run? Okay, so I don't know what else to tell you. What else do you have? That's it. I want to thank Mr. Dillon. Um, I had a couple problems on New Brook Street, um, Elm Street with the grass, people not cutting the grass, and then people leaving their homes. And I can't thank Mr. Dillon enough. Um, the guys are out. By the time I call him, I have no problem with it. Also, um, Bristol Borough girls. Softball, um, Buster Spadacino, um, Brian Spadacino, they did. And we should be proud of the way our softball teams, even our hardball teams, um, they represent Bristol and they almost won it all. That's all I want. Are we going to bring them in? I think so. I think definitely Buster and Brian. I mean, they. Very I know Monday Betty night. likes to do that. She usually does it, yeah. so we'll, we can wait. But our team's over there. Now, um, Jeff has the, the camps over there today. There was a lot of kids there. And um, I just left the Spanish kids over there playing right now. Mm -hmm. Our fields get used more than anybody I know. And it goes all the way to September. We have three adult hardball teams to play every weekend there. I agree so, with you. I mean, that's a home run over there. Robin. Um, yeah, a couple things. Who determines the fee schedule for the zoning board? And I'll tell you why. Uh, last Wednesday night, or perhaps it was the Wednesday before, whenever there's a zoning meeting in the West Ward, I always attend um, to either support my constituents or, or speak against the project, depending on what my, my constituents want. Um, there was one hearing that night, one applicant that night. I was there. I had asked Bill to come because it was something that I wasn't real sure of, that I had already asked them not to approve months ago. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the real estate agent was there. We paid, the borough paid $100 to each one of the board members who got dressed after a long day of work, got fixed up, showed up like they're asked to. Um, the stenographer gets paid $100. The board members all get paid $100. I don't know what the attorney gets paid. Everybody was there, and the person who made the application just didn't show up. 
just didn't show up. And we said, well, where's the applicant? And they said that the realtor who listed the property said, well, we tried to reach him, but I think he's on vacation. And made a joke and said, oh, as hot as it is, I wouldn't have come back either. But my issue is when they go, if, Leo, if you had to go for a zoning application, you would pay $250 is what they pay to go before the board. That $250, this guy just didn't show up at all. Everybody got paid. He'll come back again next month, but he doesn't have to pay another $250. My point is, to me, that's wasting taxpayers' money. It's a slap in the face. If you can't come and you had notified people 24 hours in advance, I wouldn't have been there, board members wouldn't have been there, solicitors and stenographers. So, Bill, I don't know who determines the fee schedule, but I really think that there ought to be, if you don't show up for a zoning meeting, you should lose your $250 and have to reapply and pay again. Now, what's your answer to that, Bill? <laughs> uh, you're talking about two different things. Uh, if, if they don't want to grant the continuance, they can deny it, at which point they would have to refile. I think maybe a better thing to do is... Uh, Maybe uh, we could see about setting a fee that if you don't call, don't show up, and you want to continue, it's, that's fine, but there's going to be a fee for that. Okay. Because, again, it's particularly that night, everybody came in, it was the only hearing, and it was just a waste. Right. Uh, so uh, let me look into how and to what extent we can change the fee schedule. Okay, I just hate to see money wasted that way. I uh, wanted to let council know that I'll be meeting with civil service next week. Civil service is going to meet to get an eligibility list together, start the process. So we'll have a, a full eligibility list for hiring police officers. Um, the vacant property review board, I'm also going to get that, that meeting next week, uh, get that started. Um, the food bank, uh, Liz did a wonderful story on the food bank, and, and I was, was thrilled to be a part of it. But I'd like to see us start maybe as a town. If everybody who showed up at these meetings, I think I counted nine or ten people, if every person who came to these meetings brought a non-perishable item for the food bank, it would be huge. I just think that we need to be mindful. Perhaps when you guys do the do-op, if somebody would bring, we could have, uh, we could borrow uh, carts from Selecto, and ask people if the food bank is in dire need of food. And there's people in this town that really don't have the means and, and really depend on that food bank. So let's just see if as a group we can come up with something that'll, that'll help that. Um, talking about the, uh, the, the um, bridging the Delaware last night, oh, on Saturday night, it was, a gr it was great. There was a lot of people. There was fireworks, but the, the only thing that I think is going to be problematic, and I've spoken about it before, is our traffic calming, our police, uh, fire police. We don't have very many volunteers. So I'm suggesting that Merle and the chief and myself and the mayor sit down and come up with some kind of a plan to present to council on what, we, I don't know whether it would be a town watch, I don't know whether we have to go into Bristol Township and perhaps have people who are doing the venues start to pay, but we need more people to close down streets, et cetera. It was at 10 of 9, it was a mess because everybody came for the, and they all came at the same time. So it was, so I just think that we need to be proactive in, in, in safety issues. So I thought that, that perhaps we would do that. Speaking of Merle, I have to say, and you know that I am not one ever, I don't, I don't ever, I think people are supposed to do their job, so I'm never one to say good job. And, uh, but I got to tell you, I don't think that Merle Winslow got 10 hours sleep all weekend long between not having electric on Friday night and then Grundy going out on Saturday night and the, the events down at the river. And I just think we're really, really, really lucky to have him because no matter what happens, you can call Merle and he gets right on it and he knows what's going on. And, and I appreciate that. Um, and then the last thing is that I would like to put on the agenda to appoint um, Gladys Harper, who lives at 208 Mill Street, and Ron McGuckin, who lives at 213 Mill Street. We have two vacancies on the uh, Police con uh, Complaint Review Board, and I'd like to fill that, that board so that um, these two people have both agreed to, to be on it. So I think we should put that on the agenda. And that's it. Okay. Yeah, that's right. On and on. <laughs> uh, I got a, just a couple things. One, I got a letter. 
I put in everybody's packet from the parade committee requesting a donation again of $2,500 for the parade. Uh, I think this year uh, we really need to look at our budget before we just for next year. I mean, it's in this year's budget, but I think when we set our budget for 2013, we really need to start looking at a lot of things that are going on. The other thing is I spoke to the manager and I spoke to Kurt from Gilmore and Associates. I'd like to know if council's okay with maybe putting some of these boards in like First Federal Bank, the theater, a couple restaurants, just a little PR to say this is what the borough is proposing down at the mm -hmm. wharf. Hopefully it becomes a reality. Um, I mean, I feel confident that we're going to get some money. How much, I don't know, but you know, let people in town get, you know, have a little good feeling about what's going on. So if we could make some boards, maybe change some of the, the wording on there. Propose, you know, I'll sit down with you, Kurt, and I just think if, if everybody's okay with that, I like to distribute them around town and, you know, maybe in a library put one just so people can see what our, our plans are. Uh, Bobby, you and Mer, I'd like to meet maybe next, well, next week I'm going to be busy with the St. Anne Church Carnival, but I'd like to meet maybe the week after to set up the procedure if the fire companies are going to buy gas from the borough or not so we can get that resolved. Get it. Maybe we could do it at your fire board meeting. Okay. We'll just make us. Uh, all right, let's set that up. If, who, what companies want to use our gas station so we can get that resolved? Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Leo and a couple people down at the ball fields. And just for the record, we need to address the big hardball field in the back and the Little Lake Field, which we all call the Little Lake Field on Jefferson Avenue where the concession stand is. I think that Leo does, uh, Leo's son does an outstanding job in maintaining the fields, but they're at a point now where the fields need to be redone. And what I mean redone is we need to bring somebody in, skin the fields, uh, put new dirt down, get the drainage corrected, and uh, get them ready for next year. Now this has to be done in September so it could be ready for the high school when they start using it in April. When do they use it? April, Leo? In they April. Mar they start March 1st. If you go look at the big hardball field in the back, there's a big dip coming up on the infield. So if you're trying to field the ball and you're not in the right position, that ball's going to come up, you know, take a bad hop and come up at you. But We've been doing the best we can over the last five, six years with the fields. We know we need to address them. I also like to address the backstops on the big hardball field and Little League field to stop the balls from foul balls going into the parking lot, maybe extend the overhang on the, the backstops. So we went out and we got some projected numbers and we got Kurt involved. If we have to restake the two fields, re grade them, uh, put the right dirt in them, and redo the backstops. We're probably, and I'm throwing a number out, which I'm hoping uh, comes in a lot under that, is about $50,000. So what I'm asking council to do, since we're under time restraint to get this done, is to take some of this capital improvement money that we just spoke with tonight, and I think that's where you put your money to good use for the kids of this town. And let's authorize, put on the agenda to authorize the manager to go out the bid and to award the bid, and then we could ratify it at September's meeting. Is that possible, Billy? We give the manager authorization to do that. Not to exceed a certain amount of money. What are the individual bids going to be? It's going to be broken down. Well, we don't know. They're going to be over ten thousand dollars. There's no question. Well, the new figure is eighteen five. And eighteen five in material. What I'm saying is, can we make an agenda item since we're under time constraint to say 
we want to do the ball fields. I'm polling five members of council right now to give the manager authorization to go out to bid, accept the bids, open the bids, and award the contract. But we're not going to do the job until, Leo, when's everybody done? September what? September 1st. First? So we're probably not going to do, when's our work session? September what? So then why don't we get, we can vote on it on the fourth to award the bid. So let's do it that way. But let's give Jim the authority to go out and solicit bids on the backstops in the fields. And, and on the backstops, I mean, Freddie Cullen, Bristol High, they come every year and they're rigging it all up. No, we need to redo that, it. That hasn't been done for 20 years, that backstops. Yeah. It's, it ain't caught a ball yet on our ball field. All right. The trees will catch more balls, but all the trees are gone. I mean, I don't have a little league field with these new bats and balls. What's happening when the high school plays are going right into the street. Mm -hmm. So to get an overhang on it where it would just go right up and then it's done because somebody's going to get hurt. Well, I don't have a fields throughout the, the minor league and the soft, the old softball field in good shape. And the tee ball. How, how about can we add like a netting or something over that that uh, that playground that's right in the center? But that's dangerous. I mean, I see, that was I see the, the first kids over question, there. But they never had an issue with glass. Dude, I don't think nobody hits home runs over on that. Nah. Well, right. I understand. First one, I don't want, absolutely. I don't want the first kid that you know they hit a home run. Then. My concern is the high school has a real good team coming back. They should have, you know, they can go a long way. I mean, they were 19 and one. So let's just do it right one time. I mean, it hasn't been done in the hardball field since. I think young Gary Tossey played there, and that's been at least 20, 25 years. We just about 30 years. Yeah. But anyway, I think that, you know, not that I want to start spending this money, but I think that putting money into the two fields, getting them back in shape, putting new back, whatever we need to do, uh, that's money well spent. And that's where I think our money should go. When I say capital improvement, that's an improvement to the – to the town and for all the people who use the two fields. I agree. Okay. Absolutely. That, Jim, let's make that an agenda item. Right, but, but, but. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So we have all the specs that you need. I mean, when this bid goes out, it'll be very specific oh, yeah. as to what we need. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I don't have any kids that play ball. I'm the, I'm the odd man out here. So I'm looking at the seniors saying, $50,000. Um, all right. I mean, let, let's and and I guess if it, if the bids came in too high, we don't have to accept it. I don't think the bids are going to come in more than 35, 30 to 35 to do the fields. Okay. But I think we need to address the, the two backstops that are there. And see, again, I I don't know anything about. I mean, I I drive past them. That's all I do. So. Uh, um, Missing some good games over there. Sweetheart, I, I had six you. children. I <laughs> live my life on four sons. I live my life on baseball fields. I know all about it, bro. <laughs> I don't go anymore. That's a great I address the ball fields. I address the gas. All right, I'm going to talk about cats. I know you and Tony were dealing with cats. I don't know if you have any more updates, Tony. or No, I mean... The, the last thing that we talked about was what I brought up. So I heard it's like you even said that would be ridiculous to spend. Oh, yeah, you can't. I mean, it would, the man hours and then how much it would cost would be over like $150,000 to do that. Well, I got an idea, so. Oh, good. Let's see if we can use my idea and it won't cost that much. All right, I'm down. Spoke to the SBCA, okay, and like you said, they're willing to neuter the cats. And we got to catch them and everything. We make a recommendation that the borough invest in about 10 traps. They're about $75 a piece. It's a humane trap. We give the trap to the people that are complaining. They come to the borough. They say we have a cat problem. We sign this, this trap to Tony Devine. You take the trap home. You trap the cat in this uh, trap, you call the SPCA, 
the SPCA said within 24 hours they'll pick up the cat, neuter the cat, and then return it. So basically what we're doing is we're saving hundred and some thousand dollars, but we're putting a lot of the responsibility on the homeowner. But I think that's good so because if they really have a problem, they're going to be willing to do it. That we'll provide the trap. Now if and the SPCA, let cat. me finish, if the SPCA doesn't pick up the cat in 24 hours, then we'll send our ACO officer out there. He'll pick up the cat, bring it back, leave it in a trap, and then the SPCA, because they could be tied up on something. But I think if people are complaining and they want to get rid of these cats or they want to stop reproducing cats, to me, this is an easy way to say, okay, you got a problem, we'll provide you to, to trap, come to the bar, we'll sign it to you, show proper identification. You know, if we get beat out of a trap, it's not like, you know, they took $100,000, but we don't want people keeping the traps either. There's also an organization, just so you know, called Forgotten Cats. Mm -hmm. And if you go to their website, they also will come. They'll pick up the cats and they'll neuter them and right. bring them back. So that's an. But I'm saying, what do you think about that situation? Well, that's a great idea. We've got what to do something. What it does, something. council's trying to help. We're trying to do the best we can to correct this problem. But we can't afford to pay our animal control officer. We can't afford to run cats up to the SPCA. So if you have a problem, you need if you got a major problem, you need two traps. We'll give you the trap. You trap them. You put a little food in. They're easy. This is nice. We're working together. You know what I mean? <laughs> did a good job, didn't I? You want to commend me? There's something I want to say, but I can't. It's inappropriate. Huh? <laughs> I figure you said there was. Can I get a question, Dan? Are you two done patting each other on the back? Can I get a question? Is it okay for the, the cats? You said that would not hurt a cat, right? This trap is friendly to cats. Okay. Because there are a lot of people that are concerned trap. about cats, right. too. It's and a I, certain you know. trap that the SPCA recommends you buy. And that's the trap. And we don't have buy. to pay the SPCA for the spay or neutering of the cat. Okay, I like that idea. Good, Ralph. You're all really we're doing good. Doing is all we're doing is putting the burden on the homeowner or the tenant to trap the cat. And we'll okay. decrease population that way. Uh, that's in, a, in a couple of years, you'll right. see a major Pretty difference. Sweet. Okay, I like it. Mr. Divine. Excellent job. All right, stop there. Oh, Don't you go keep looking your already. luck here. You <laughs> <laughs> I got a, I got a couple things. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first, I would like are to. You know what they are? Okay, good. Because yeah, I, I knew. Like, I would like to personally thank Merle Winslow for this past weekend. He did a fabulous job. Uh, he kept me informed of what was going on, both Friday night and. Uh, Saturday night or Sunday night when the uh, thing went out. Uh, he did a fabulous job. Mr. Dillon, I did see him out there. I was out there also riding around. You were out to his curfew. I, I thought I was thought I was back in the police car riding around town when the lights were out. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in our packet, and I'm sure Mr. Dillon or Mr. Salerno is going to bring it up, is the lease I was with the, uh, the new... It's not called a senior center anymore. It's called the Bristol Borough Area Active Adult Center. Uh, as of August 1st, I'm on that board. We took over the 301 Mill Wood Street uh, property. Uh, we would like to see more than a year to year lease on this, if possible, because we plan on uh, doing a lot of upgrades in there and we don't want to see that like if maybe three, four years down the road we do all these upgrades and this council's not in here, maybe they're not, the new council comes in and says, we're going to break the lease. We want everything in there. After we, the board, got together and got all these this grant money to uh, upgrade like a new heating system, air conditioning system, different things like that. We just spent $9,000 on a... Uh, new dishwasher, uh, new alarm system, we spend money on that, and uh, I think it would be uh, feasible if we could extend that instead of from year to year to minimum a 15-year lease. 
the uh, you had it with the uh, the association. You had a 50-year lease. Is there any reason why we can't get that also? I'm just curious. I just now I'm only speaking for myself. I don't see anything wrong with a year-to-year -year lease. I think any member of council that threw, that would come in and throw out senior citizens out of a building for no reason probably wouldn't sit here the next election. And as far as, you know, I just think that a 50-year lease or whatever really isn't necessary if you have trust in each organization, in borough council and in this group. And, I mean, we gave this group... <coughs> With Robin's recommendation in two years, $18,000. So I don't think anybody sitting here is against helping the seniors in any way. I just think that we should monitor the lease. And my opinion is, I think year to year, there's nothing wrong with it. Can I just ask, so what, what is the purpose, though, of a year to year lease? I'm just Versus curious. A 50 year lease? No, all right, but I mean, there, between a year to year and a 50 year, perhaps we can come up with a 15 year. My only concern with a with a year to year is, like Bob said, we may not be here. You're a good well, guy. Before but, we leave, we sign a lease. Well, but the only other thing is that they've always been there. That's been their home. I just feel like they would feel more secure in putting money into it if they could get something beyond a year-to-year -year lease. So that that's kind of my thought. They had a 50-year lease and they, they, they were there for 40 of the 50 years for that lease. I, I mean, I... We're they just were concerned. There 40 to 50. Well, they had a 50-year lease that would, that it would expire in 10 years, but when the association agreed to break the lease, they were there for 40 years. The lease was already in effect for 40 years with another 10 year on the lease. Uh, I mean, we're not asking too much. We're just asking, you know, I'm like, I don't know how to say it, but uh, if this council's not here for some obvious reasons, some of you decide not to run again, and we get new people in there, and I'm saying that, I'm not gonna say that they're gonna throw them out, but we would feel more comfortable with at least a 15 year lease compared to a year to year. Especially when we're gonna be trying to put grant monies in there. I mean, we got we, we do have a lot of grant monies that's available to us, and, uh, you know, we're working on it, and we're just, you know, we don't want all the upgrades, because it says in the lease that they're responsible or we're responsible for the upgrades, and then all of a sudden, boom, we're told that we can't stay there anymore. They would feel more comfortable. With so maybe it's something that we can all talk about during... We've got... So, yeah, we've got two weeks, and and honestly, I mean, the, but this isn't anything that we've talked, right, Lorraine? I mean, we, you know, the lease was prepared, and that's fine. We have a copy of it. I mean, so we've been made aware, but I don't think any of us have had the opportunity of saying, hey, Tony, how do you feel? Hey, Leo, how do you feel? You know what I mean? So, and Merle's got his hands up. There is, there is a member of the board, uh, board here also that if he would like to speak about it, I don't know, Gino? You guys are rather eloquently taken care of. Yeah, I'll have a couple of things to say, I guess. Um, number one, we're not asking for a 50-year lease. We just would like it to be for a little longer than one. So we have a sense that we're safe in instituting all of the capital improvements that we're planning on. And that's about all we're asking for. We have no problem with the council. We absolutely are thankful for all the support you've given us over the past couple of years, and, and we hope that it will continue. we just like a little longer on the lease. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. You want to add to this? this? Yeah, I was going to say, the problem is that they're looking to keep grants or whatever, 50 they are. I, I would like to see them apply for a grant to get an emergency generator take care of that ability that's, because we use that as a pooling center. That's number one and two. That's number one and two on our priority list of what we want to get done. Is this an executive session discussion now? Well, it's not an executive session discussion, so do you want to discuss it publicly since you and Bobby are Discuss what? We discuss it. Lorraine, what do you think? Here, here's my question. It's a dollar a year. <clears throat> is that the 
Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I think 50 years is way too many years to. Yeah, I know. Well, he said 50. I'm going with what he said. But um, uh, maybe five years, something like that. You know. Is Tommy, there. what do you think? Um. I think it's it's been there for so long, 40 years. I mean, I would love to to be able to give those guys as long as they would need, you know what I mean, to, to feel comfortable. I just don't – what does the year-to-year -year lease tell them? It just says, look, if, you, if something happens, we can pull a plug on you. Well, I, I think everybody's – I think what we're all missing mm -hmm. the point here is that how about if this group changes? Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's talking about council changing. How about – if their organization changes and you get some people that are really running this place into the ground, now what are we going to do? We have no leverage. We can't go in to help the seniors because they're going to say, "Can't." Do. I think a year-to-year -year lease works for both organizations. I don't think there's a council member that would ever come in this council chamber and vote against senior citizens. I, I know, as long as I'll be sitting, I would never do that. Right, but that. if this group is right now is all gung ho and you know you got a lot of good people involved, a year from now or two years from now this group falls apart and we get another group in there and now we have no recourse to go in and say we're unhappy with what's going on here. So I think it keeps that group on their toes to keep doing a good thing for the seniors of the borough, and I think it makes keeps council honest. To say, you know, again, who's going to throw out this group? Right, but how about even if we, even if we would word it that way to protect both of, both of our interests, if the majority of that group is no longer part of it, then we need to maybe come back in front of council and reestablish it. We can have something like that. I didn't think this was going to be an issue tonight to discuss, but we'll stay as long as we have to. Leo, what do you think? Um, I'm like Lorraine, 5, 10. I have no problem with it. I mean, my aunts all go there, and I have problems with that. No, I would never, ever throw anybody out of here. But I wouldn't either. I could see your point, too. You put a lot of time and work in over there. I would... Feel the same way. So rain and you want to put it on the you two or so you guys vote? five years. Yeah. Tony, you're shaking your head yes too. No, I'm thinking about the uh, older gentleman over there. I would like to ask you. Just say the, the older gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> the older gentleman. Just say the gentleman. The gentleman, you're right. Thank you. Sorry. Young man. Young man. Debatable. Uh, but what I was saying was this, in a respectful way, the old uh, is I, I would like to see what you guys think. You know what I mean? Like, we're talking, I heard 55-1. You definitely don't want one. What do you think about five? I'm okay with five. All right. They're okay with five. I'm going to have Billy speak, but right now the recommendation I'm hearing is five. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like yeah, I I would be I would be okay with five. Why don't you explain why you did a year to year lease? Well, I mean, it was suggested I start off with that. Obviously, this had to be discussed. Um, as long as I can remember, eight ten years, there's been an issue between the former organization and council and what was going on over there. And one of the reasons council did not have controls because the group had a 50 year lease. And I think you have a new organization that looks like they're doing a great job. And I just thought council would want to keep control over that for a while. Uh, and that's the purpose of the year or year lease. Now, three years from now, it looks like they're doing a great job. You can give them a five-year lease, a ten-year lease. It doesn't matter. But, I mean, just in any business, uh, you know, if you own a building and are going to lease it to somebody and it's an unknown entity, you're not necessarily going to give them a five-year lease if you're not quite sure what kind of tenant they're going to be. So that's what I was thinking of, and, and you know, but it's up to council. They want to go in five years? Five years. Uh, and I understand what their concerns are. They don't want to put a lot of investment if they're not going to be around. But I think Ralph's concerned that, you know, you're, you're entering into a lease with an organization, but there's no saying who's going to control that organization. 
It's an organization that has a lease. If there's a new president, a new board in three or four years, council stuck with those uh, uh, those individuals. How often does your elections come up to change who runs the place every year? Every two, no, Why? two years. Every two years. So the president's elected for two years? So what I'm saying is, why wouldn't you elect your president for 10 or 15 years? That's, <laughs> That's how it's written in our bylaws. I mean, I, well, I mean, why do we re-elect our president every two years? We do. <laughs> My, my recommendation is this council is here no matter what until January of 2013. Nobody's leaving here until then. If we sign a one-year lease, it comes up again in September of 13. And at that point, if we want to extend the lease for five years, so give yourself a year. Let's see what's going on. I mean, nobody has a problem with working with your group. My concern is if your group falls apart, that this council is going to be stuck with somebody coming in that we may not want to deal with. Not that we're going to close the place down, but at least we have a little leverage to protect the senior citizens that go there. That's all. My concern is to protect the people that go there. Can I, I I'm, I'm just confused as to what could transpire. Let's pretend a new group takes over. What could transpire that would put our ownership and all we do is own the building in jeopardy? And and in the lease, isn't it built in that we have control over who they rent to, what, what the building is used for? I guess I just don't understand what our fear is if, let's say, all new members were, were elected. What could they do? They could run the place into the ground. Don't open it whenever they want change the hours, do things at night instead of during the day. A lot of things they can do. How long has your president been in now? Since she's the president of, a, of the membership. About a year now? A year? Maybe. About a year and a half right now. Yeah, but all, well, she's not, she's not, she's not, she's only the, right now, she's the president of the membership, which she was for the last two years. Uh, this board just took over as, as a whole board the 1st of August. Okay? And, and even though we were in the background making sure that the senior center was operational uh, from June till this June, June of last year till this year, they went from a $30,000 uh, in the red and, and go, brought it out. But my, my question is, as long as we're able to protect ourselves with, with uh, the, the different limitations that we put on, just like we did the one time when they, they, they had those people come over with the musicians, they were staying overnight, they were doing stuff they weren't supposed to do. Right. At the one, I mean, aren't we protecting our, ourselves with stuff like that? Like what's written in there? Well, they're supposed to notify us of any, anybody's using the building. So can you write things in there when, you, when they're doing They things are in there. They are in there. Did you read the lease? They are in there. No, I didn't read it. I'm saying but What we're saying now is anybody that uses the building needs to come get approval from the borough. Right. Which protects us. Right. Why don't I just do this? Why don't I tell the manager to put on the agenda for the 20th to sign a lease with the senior citizens anywhere from one to five years, and that night you guys pick? Is that fine? That's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Everybody can vote. Everybody can vote out. Yeah. You know, somebody makes a motion, says one year. Somebody makes a motion, says five years, and we vote on it. Okay, that's fine. Is that fair? Yeah, fine. Yeah, because then everybody gets to do what they want to. Is that Mr. Dillon, you have anything? Uh, no, just a point of information that uh, August 20th is the council's uh, rescheduled public meeting. And at 6.30, there will be a public hearing on the proposed new borough subdivision and land development ordinance uh, that the, uh, the engineer and staff has been working on, I would say, for the past year or so. Once the uh, land development and subdivision ordinance is eventually adopted in some form by council, then we will have the complete codification 
complete it and uh, that hasn't been done in about 30 years so it's it's uh, something that's been scheduled for 630 the the borough engineer and borough solicitor will conduct the uh, the, the hearing to explain to the public uh, exactly uh, uh, what the ordinance uh, will be uh, accomplishing so that's just a point of information and uh, I believe that's all I have so we have anything no Anybody in public have anything before we adjourn? Anybody else in council? Mayor? No, that's all I have.